accompanied by an exhibition of her more museum-friendly works in the neighbouring project space, 80-year-old artist Sheila Hicks has taken over Dan Graham's Sunset Pavilion at the Hayward Gallery with a colourful, playful and exuberant installation of pigmented bales. Just before the official opening, I sat down with Sheila and the Hayward's chief curator, Stephanie Rosenthal, to discuss how the exhibition came about and why it's taken until now to see her work on such a scale in London. Um, OK, so we're here in the Sunset Pavilion Inhabited, um, which is your first show in a UK institution, I believe. How has it taken so long to come about? I mean, you're, you're, you turned 80 last summer and you've got a 50-year career behind you. I'm really 100, but I don't tell anyone. <laughs> in any case, it's taken even longer. <laughs> and it's not the first show in London or in England. But I think it's good mythology. <laughs> Is it the first one in a publicly funded institution, perhaps? Probably, although Lord Eccles, the Minister of Culture, inaugurated my show in London in 1965. Okay. But it was not in a publicly funded mm -hmm. institution. Okay, well, let's talk about how this show came about, maybe. Stephanie. Well, I think it's more fun to talk about him. Okay. Because <laughs> the next day after the show opened, he took my five-year-old daughter <clears throat> to shore the London Zoo, mm -hmm. because in his mind, the Minister of Culture, that was the cultural thing to do. And I sort of follow that lead in coming back to London to do something that can compete with the London Zoo. You can imagine some animals kind of having a whale of a time in here, including human animals. <laughs> <laughs> like us. Like us. <laughs> And I think your question, what you were wondering, is, is why Sheila Hicks now? And I think mm. what was, it's always interesting for me that you'll have these new developments in contemporary art and you think, oh, a lot of artists who are in their early 20s work in a certain way or you see things. Like I started to see a lot of artists working with textile and fabric and then suddenly the, the visual art and contemporary art world really embraced it. And knowing Sheila's work, I was like, but that's happening since a very long time and it's kind of coming out of a certain tradition and I think what, what we like to do and was what I like to show with, with Sheila's work is that it's so contemporary that you wouldn't look at it and think like oh this is like definitely rooted in the 60s it's very much I think she works in a way which is extremely contemporary and inspiring for a young generation and that's what we're doing here in the project space and I think what is so fantastic is that Sheila is the first artist who has that long career who's showing in the project space because she basically, for me, she is in, on the same level than an artist who, you know, just m the most recent work. So mm -hmm. I think it's a nice, it was a nice thing for us to show someone who has such a long career and at the same time is so influential and so contemporary. And I think the contemporary aspect is really since probably five, ten years, the, the boundaries between crafts, visual art, architecture are much more falling down. And mm -hmm. I think more and more younger artists realize actually that they have much more opportunities in adventuring out. And Sheila has done that from the beginning on, mm -hmm. and she was never very pretentious about saying, oh, I'm a visual artist or I'm not. You know what artists do a lot, usually they want to be in a box, and I think she never wanted that. And I think this is the, the energy and the power of her work really comes from embracing everything and not thinking, what am I or what do I want to be, but just kind of work with whatever comes to her, I think, a bit. I mean, did you deliberately pull down barriers between arts and crafts? Was that part of you? Were, you were taught by Joseph Albers when you were at Yale. Do you think it was a Bauhaus influence, or is it more incidental than that? I think I'm treading on dangerous territory because I've enjoyed a whole career of being an outside outsider, mm. art outsider. I don't know if now I want to become an art insider. <laughs> So in this sense of idea of barriers and coming mm -hmm. in and crossing boundaries and am I conscious of where I am and what I'm doing and what are the labels today? I guess it's going to be harder and harder for me to be, to remain an outsider. Do you think as an outsider you have more freedom? To Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. And you have less followers and you have uh, interesting people who are really opening their eyes and not just following trends. Mm -hmm. I'm afraid the parade's getting very long of the trend followers right now. 
When did you begin working with fibres? I mean, I know you went on a Fulbright scholarship. I think I started when my grandmother taught me how to pick up a thread and make something with it, mm -hmm. sitting on the steps, <coughs> waiting for my father to come home from work. How old were you then? Maybe seven, eight, nine, ten. It was a passe-temps, a way de passar el tiempo, to Passing pass time. time. Mm -hmm. It's a way of waiting peacefully, anticipating something exciting, yes. like your father coming home from work. This is in Detroit during the Second World War. Mm. That dates our conversation. <laughs> but you, you trained in painting. If you trained with any of the Bauhaus masters, you trained in everything, okay. including painting. Mm -hmm. And the tendency it seems to be, or was, in the art world, <clears throat> that painting sits on top of mm -hmm. the pyramid, along with sculpture. It's the iceberg's melting because, of course, performance art, theater, video, all of these things are moving upwards and are prevalent and people are in schools migrating with their computers into art. Yeah. Picking up materials in your hands is rare. Picking up flying ideas on your computer is more prevalent. And what I think, what, what for me is always interesting when you say, oh, did you p study painting? I always feel like reading um, what you say in your biography that it, it nearly feels like you the travels were at the beginning something which you which were kind of nearly what you studied and all the different things you've seen and, and met during these travels. Would you say that was a huge influence, like being so early on traveling through Latin America and having all the opportunities of seeing the colors mm. and the kind of ways of working? I think the photography was very important for me in the 1950s. Mm -hmm traveling alone as a woman. My companion was a, f a camera and a notebook. And then to just squat and sit and observe and watch what was happening and what was happening around me throughout South America where I traveled were people making things, making things they were going to wear or making things they were going to sit on or protect themselves with or cover. And the making, the making was magical. I had studied art history at Yale. And at art history, one of the courses I took was pre-Columbian art history. Well, now, if you think of Latin America and you think of the archaeology, the archite architecture, the ancient architecture, and then you see the inhabitants all squatting, sitting, on the ground and making things. Mm -hmm. That grabbed my imagination in the art history course. So when I was traveling in these regions, I actually saw people doing this as a way of life. Mm. It seemed like a good way of life. <laughs> you work with a lot of different fibers, not just sort of threads or material that one might expect people to work with. Where do, where do those materials come from? Where do your ideas to work with strange fibres come from? Is that just collected from your travels as well? What are you wearing today? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Wool. <laughs> no, but that's an interesting question. Do you have any idea what you're wearing? Do you? Yeah, mine is cotton and wool. Probably acrylic, I guess. Do you know what you're sitting on? Wool? It looks like, doesn't it? It's it acrylic. Like, is it? It's acrylic fiber, man-made fiber. Mm -hmm. um, I don't use strange materials. I, I use materials that are in existence. Yeah. I haven't caused any to come into existence. I haven't invented any of them, but I've discovered them. 
-hmm. with the help of the people who are uh, probably making, inventing them, all of the synthetic fibers. Of course, I appreciate all the natural fibers, and I've always worked a lot with all the natural fibers. When I lived in Mexico, I used cotton a lot, mm. and wool. In France, I used linen a lot, silk, mm. metallic fibers. And now, universally, people are using synthetic fibers. Yeah. So what we're sitting in, we're sitting in these bales of acrylic, pigmented acrylic. Pigmented meaning color from natural colors, mm -hmm. from pigment. Please. Because you're sitting over there. Do you know the difference between a carrot and a radish? As vegetables, yes. <laughs> Do you know how the color of the carrot is through and through? Mm -hmm. And you know the radish, how it's a coat uh, around the exterior? Mm -hmm. Well, these fibers are like the carrots. They're not um, dyed. It's not in a color that's applied to the fiber. They're actually pigment, pigmented color existing in which they're then bound with a binding into an acrylic floss that can then be, you know, extruded in a way that you can then start to spin it and make it into a thread, into a yarn. And when you make it into a yarn, you can start to twist it, to strengthen it and give it flexibility, which means you can then weave it. And once you start weaving it, you can make a cloth or a pliable plane, mm -hmm. a textile. A pliable plane can become architecture or a tent, or a dress, or a blanket. Mm -hmm. So are these kind of huge balls of possibility and potential? These are huge bales of possibility. <laughs> and they're not filled with anything apart from what we see on the outside? I mean, it's that through and through? They're like the carrot. <laughs> <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> And would you use this same material for some of your minims and the, the... For the rest of the things in the exhibit? Mm -hmm. These materials which fascinate me, these new synthetics, um, have, they've been shipped into my studio, so they're parked like this in the studio. And so I dream about them, I think about them, I play with them, and they wander into my work. <laughs> So you have a studio full of these kind of bales? Yes, my studio has disappeared <laughs> because it's full of fibre. That's why it's good to get it out here. Yeah. <laughs> You're just turning this into another storage space. Space, <laughs> space in the studio. There's a temporary warehouse for two months. <laughs> um, how did you decide what you were going to put here? I mean, you've said you were inspired by the idea of the zoo and creating something as absorbing as that. but. You responded in some way to the architecture of the, the building. Oh well, of course. The, I always begin. W I mean, I always begin with space and light and scale. Mm. And when you are offered an opportunity to do something or make something, you have to w physically walk into it, sit down, feel it, think about it. It sounds like the Feng Shui story of having to figure out where the sun is coming from and where the magnetic energy is and all this, where the buses are passing and where the vibration of the subways felt. But you come into this kind of space and it's um, very wide open. It's wonderful because of the light, mm. because of the um, intimacy of the space. You, you physically are not overwhelmed by it. Yeah. You feel welcomed into the space. And it's a unique space, imagine. London, it's one of the two or three probably most unique spaces in London. Mm. If I'd be in Paris, I'd have to compare it to the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> um, but here in London, it's a very special kind of knee, like a little nest, no? A nido. Mm -hmm. It's a kind of welcoming small space. And then if you bring texture and color into it, and you even say, like museums there, you know as soon as you walk into a museum, do not touch. Yeah. You're taught since you're a child. 
And here you break all the rules and you say, you just go and lie down and relax and touch. Mm -hmm. So when Sheila come to see the, came to see the space for the first time, she was right away saying she wants to do something in the Den Graham Pavilion. So that's a work yeah. he did for the Hayward in 2004, the pavilion. And it's actually the first time he gave us the permission to really? use it. And it was just due to basically Sheila was suggesting a conversation and he accepted it. And so I think it was very clear for you that you want a need to use that space and that it would be really the counterpart to the rest of the exhibition to have that what you now call zoo. <laughs> <laughs> it's the oasis. Do you, don't, do you feel yourself to be in a museum here? No. Where are you? It's a very good question. <laughs> in a dream. Good answer. <laughs> no? Un sueño. Yeah, Reverie. Huh? I hope the people in London feel that Get way that. and just wander in. And I think also the play, I mean, if you look here, it has something very playful. But then also if you look into the other part of the exhibition, there are lots of elements where it is really about chance or kind of playing with this, the batons and the balls and the, nearly the feeling you can move things around either in your head or, mm -hmm. or it is about movement, this idea of color, um, calligraphy or choreography of space. I think that all kind of comes back in a way and culminates in, in, in that space here. What you really want to ask yourself today is, does it have political or social impact? It's not obvious, but it's very profound. Mm -hmm. It's not the obvious super layer of a political message or a social necessity. But when you go just two or three steps deeper, you realize it has great social political impact on your life and on your feeling about your community, your city, your state, your, the world situation, the anguish, the tension, what we're all living through at this period in history. And you have a tendency to migrate into this quiet space to think all those questions over. Mm -hmm.